God does not grant a great gift without a great trial. If we're going to do anything for God, which is what we're trying to do now, we have to expect a trial. If we want to do great things for God and receive a great gift, then that trial will be very great. But God does not give us gifts that we cannot um, bear. In other words, trials, I mean, sorry, not gifts. Um, if we can't bear very little, we won't get very much. It's as simple as that. That's, that's the way it works, the spiritual logic. There are three, so Isaac talks about three types of temptation. Involved in them is one, is God. Temptations from God. So there's temptation from a human being, and the final temptation is from the devil. So there's three. There's God, a human being, and the devil. One of the prime examples that we know from the Old Testament is, is the sacrifice, potential sacrifice of Isaac by Abraham. That was a terrible trial that God put on, upon Abraham. But he knew that Abraham loved him and trusted him. And even though he was asked to, to sacrifice his own son, he knew, he knew that somehow this would be what he should do. And God was impressed, obviously, and, and stopped Abraham from uh, slaying Isaac. So that is a, a test, an amazing um, temptation. Can you imagine that, that you have children? You have to sacrifice your child because God asks you. I mean, it's not going to happen, so we're so far removed, it doesn't really mean much. But I think it, it would do. Uh, you know, well, you know, children who become martyrs, encouraged by their parents to, to martyr them. It's an amazing thing, but it, it's, it's, it's what people do and have done. Um, in, in Isaiah 48, it says that uh, God's chosen people are always in the furnace of affliction. So to follow God, you have to be prepared to go into the furnace of affliction. But we want to have a, a quiet, nice life, quiet without any problems, and uh, this is what we want. It's true, but it's not the Christian life, it's not the spiritual life that God has given to us, each one of us. Nobody here is born by chance, we're here because God has, has decided that, and so we need to pray to find out what we have to do to be ourselves as, as God has created us. There isn't a mold that we fit into, we're all different. We're individual in that sense, but we're not individuals, we're persons because we belong to community. The devil tempted Adam and Eve. There's another trial with temptation. He also tempted our Lord in the desert. So our Lord was tempted with trials. So you know, we cannot be without them either if we're, if we're serious in our faith. And there's another form of, of, of temptation, and that is when man tempts God. The reverse. How do we tempt God? When we, don't, when we disbelieve. In our faith we lose our faith, or we do not trust God because we were, to, we're weak. So we're, we're tempting God in that sense. And, and St. James' epistle, it says, every man is, temp is tempted when he is drawn away in his own lust. In other words, it's our choice. So we can tempt God by, by drawing away from, from him because we are so involved in ourselves. We're so tied up in ourselves, me, 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 that we cannot um, bear any sort of temptation that God sends us. Temptation says, um, trials sent by God are sent with the aim of healing the illnesses of the soul. So the temptations that come from God, individually, each one of us has a, room, a series of temptations, and will have, um, it's for our benefit. It's hard to see that, because it depends on the temptation, of course. And some temptations, well, we say, well, that's, that's the way it is. I mean, what will happen? What would happen? Um, if Christianity is banned in this country. That's a possibility. 
You have to go underground. Could we bear with that? Could we stand up publicly and fight against it? That's a big temptation, the temptation of persecution. The temptation that you have children that will be persecuted. Here's a new baby here. But this is in God's hands and in God's plan. God is not cruel. He, he has wisdom. Um, we don't understand always what you know, the ways of, of God. Trials are sent by God. Are sent, <clears throat> sorry, with the aim of healing the illnesses of soul. This is a quote from Saint Isaac. He says that um, some of our, our response um, and temptations is caused by ourselves. One of them is through impatience or impetuousness. Um, when we jump to do something quickly without thinking about it, we have created the temptation. That's not from God. We have, we have created it because we're, we're not thinking. And how many of us have done that all the, or do it all the time? We, we jump into something think, oh, well, yes, and I never thought about that. How should we approach problems that, are, that we have to solve? With prayer. We pray, and then we make the decision. Not, we make the decision and then say, well, I hope God blesses it. I remember Bishop Anthony coming to me once when I asked for something, a blessing, he said, is it posthumous? I mean, I, in other words, I've already done it, and I'm just getting a, a stamp. I mean, he's being humorous, but it, it was a thing that stuck with me forever, I remember it. I mean, I didn't do it, by the way. I didn't do it without a blessing, but um, I just thought that was interesting that he'd obviously dealt with, you know, thousands of people that came to the cathedral. But Christ says, actually, he says, pray ye, pray that ye not enter into temptation. Now, that seems a paradox, is not it? We're meant to be in temptation. We're meant to accept it as our, our cross that God has given us, and Christ has given us, and yet he says to the disciples, enter ye not into temptation. So Isaac says that means not to be, go accept the temptation that comes from the devil. And he has a quote here, he says that it's, the temptations are going to be blasphemy, loss of faith. The, these are the things that the devil presents. So do not enter into those temptations. Not do not enter into temptation because you are part of it. It's a part of our life. It's a part of our spiritual struggle. When a person puts his hope in God, God sends temptations in order to bring him closer. Now, Phil, this is the same about confession. When we come to confession, that we are closer to God because we're confessing our sins, especially when we realize how weak we are how worthless we are, except in God's eyes, of course, then we are closer to God. So in a way, sin is, is good for us. Good for us. Um, don't take that literally, but it's, it seems to me like that. It dr dr draws us. Because what's the opposite? The opposite is pride. I'm doing all right. I'm fine. I'm following the rules. I keep this, I do that, I do the fasting, whatever it is. This is what the Pharisees did. They could not be judged on their observance of the law, but it's their heart that Christ criticized, not their zeal and their, their um, adherence to the law. It's what's in your heart. So God tempts us in order to bring us closer. The nearer you draw and progress, the more temptations and multiply against you. That's quite a thought. So the more we make progress, the more temptations we have. I'm not talking about temptations from the devil. I'm talking about the temptations that come in everyday life. Some are caused by the devil, but there is a distinction. Isaac makes a distinction between temptations allowed by God. They are allowed to tempt you according to your strength. If you're weak, the temptations won't be as strong, but they're never beyond what you can bear. I know we don't believe it, because we th think this is the end of the world when something goes wrong, but it isn't. I mean, never tempted beyond our strength. And the more we progress in our faith, the more the temptations are multiplied. The nearer you draw and progress, the more temptations multiply against you. 
Temptations are in proportion to what we can bear. Trials are sent to the friends of God. They're sent that we are the friends of God when we accept these temptations. They're not a punishment, but they are to teach us. That's a hard one to accept in a situation, a desperate situation. This is God's trying to teach me something. What are you trying to tell me? So th this is this is very easy to, to talk about and read about, but, <laughs> but in practice it is. But it's not a punishment. He's saying here, temptation from the devil are soul-destroying and often bodily. And I've got down here venereal disease and AIDS. These are obviously outcomes of, of uh, fleshly um, temptation, evil from the devil. And so it affects us bodily as well as spiritually. And there's a, uh, I'll talk about, this I shall bring this up later. I don't know whether you know about God's, they talk about God's left hand and God's right hand. It's actually from Isaiah, uh, and yes, it's from Isaiah. Um, the left hand is when God gives you food and somewhere to live. Um, to the people in, for Israel, it was giving them a land that they could inhabit. The right hand of God is the spiritual. It's the heavenly gifts, it's the gift of wisdom. And so the, there, are, there are two, we have to, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I can't think of one moment. I'll put this in here actually. No, it'll come to me in a minute, so I don't, I don't know why. I've just put it here as a note. Temptations from God and the devil are both useful to prove our love for God. Like Abraham, he loved God, so he was willing to risk, I would kind of call it a risk, I mean, it's not a risk, but to sacrifice his own son because he loved God. And so these, these temptations that come to us are for our benefit and to prove our love for God. There's a quote here again from St. Isaac. When you wish to make a beginning in some good work, whatever that may be, a good work, first prepare yourself for temptation that will come upon you. You want to do a good work, prepare for the temptation that will come upon you. Not prepare a good work and then you think now why I, I thought this was a good idea why am I being you know attacked because you're meant to be I don't think anybody ever told me that in my whole life actually but St. Isaac's telling me this what a wonderful saint very perceptive and applicable you know he's, he's writing in the 6th century there's a whole collection of fathers of that period though are relevant, to, I feel are relevant today, they speak our language, we, we know them. I mean, literally, we don't speak their language, but they spoke Syriac. Very few people know that, of course. But they speak to our hearts. Temptations from God and the devil are both useful to prove our love for God. A quote, when you wish to make a beginning in some good work, first prepare yourself for temptation that will come upon you. Now, I think this is very practical, because it may be um, moving house, or taking up a new job, or in your work, dealing with people, and you, you pray about it, and you ask God to bless it, be prepared for temptation. Don't be surprised. I'm not talking about, oh, everything's gone wrong, okay, that, that's, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the temptation, and we have to say, okay, this is a temptation, God help me. I'm, again, it's very easy to say this, and, but the experience, you know, is, is something completely different. The spirit of life, of the spiritual life which we lead, we're really trying to lead, is a constant fluctuation, you know, shaking between periods of grace, which is God's assistance helping us, and that's pretty obvious, and we all like that, and we're very happy, and feebleness, when we give up, the presence of God we feel sometimes. Didn't we feel that at Pascha? Holy Week? Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I, I, I felt it. I don't know about you, but I did. The presence of God, the Mother of God. There's the presence of God. And then it's followed by abandonment. 
Oh dear, I've lost grace because I mean, I'm being punished. No, you're not. It's the fluctuation of the spiritual life. This is the spiritual life. This is what all the saints, everybody, went through before us. St. Isaac especially, because he's writing. What he writes about is from his experience. And it's amazing because he was a solitary. Well, he's a bishop first, and then he gave up being a bishop and went and lived in a cave as a solitary. But he's much closer to us once he did that. I'll explain that later. So, the spiritual life is a constant fluctuation. It's not, a, it's not um, defeat. Oh dear, now I've lost it. There's nothing to do with that. It's a fluctuation. It's going to happen. One day you, you, you have the grace and you feel it and it's wonderful. And then you must be prepared um, for it to suddenly become feeble yourself and say, oh dear, I can't do this. Okay? We're all guilty of that. Everybody except me. Like yeah. <coughs> yes, and then, when, then the presence of God is gain. We feel it again, and then we feel God has, has left us. He's abandoned us. So there are spiritual ups and downs. That is normal. That is a part of the spiritual life. If you have no temptation, you, you ain't on the right path. You're going the wrong way. The wrong way. <coughs> And if everything's up, up in, the, in the air and wonderful, you're also falling into deceit. You're falling into a prelist. We cannot live on a high. It's called euphoria. And you can't live like that because it's unreal. And you know what euphoria is based on? Pride. I have to be happy. I've got to be joyful all the time. This is pride. It's not humility. The opposite is humility. Is humility being pessimistic? No. Is humility, you know, being glum and un unhappy all the time? No, that's wrong. That's wrong as well. There is a joy, but you have to expect this joy on Wednesday, but not on Thursday, all right? And on Friday, you may have a vision. And on Saturday, you won't even believe for a while that there is a God. This is the spiritual life. This is our trial. This is our cross. Each one of us is different. So now Isaac is speaking in general, but in fact, I mean, he really knows what, what's happening. Periods of abandonment, when we think God is not present, are necessary that we may see our helplessness and dependence on God. Do you remember the story of St. Anthony? The Temptation of St. Anthony, the famous, the famous painting, I don't know who painted it in the West here, the Italian painter. Um, then Anthony went to live in a tomb and he prayed and for three days he was attacked by demons, physically, I mean, and, you know, you see them. And, uh, but he hung up, you know, hang in there and eventually, you know, he couldn't take any more and a light appeared and a voice said, well done, Anthony. And he said, Lord, where were you? Why did you, why did you come and help me on the first day? He said, I was here, but I wanted to see what you could do. That seems rather cruel, doesn't it, in some ways? And that's how we react. Where are you, God? Why, why are you letting this happen to me? God hasn't gone away. Just because he's withdrawn his grace temporary doesn't mean to say that you, because you're the worst of sinners. Yes, you are. We are. That's not, you know, let's not um, fool ourselves. But God's love covers all of that. We can't live uh, in, in the sort of rose garden. Atheists, to be an atheist, how terrible. That's constant abandonment of God, because there isn't a God. It's irreparable. It's terrible. You can't imagine what, the, what, the, what to, to be in, in that situation. And for atheists, the absence of God is the norm, because there isn't one. So, I see this on comments, and, you know, sometimes online when people are commenting, about the social situation, then people quote God and say there is no God. Can you know, stop bringing your imagination into this or whatever? <laughs> and well, how sad. Um, of course, it's not, it's not agnostic, um, which is not, I don't know. I mean, there might be a God. I'm not saying there isn't this and that. But the atheist is saying there isn't a God, which for me doesn't make any sense, but, but they obviously think it does. So what do we do when God abandons us, or when we feel that he's abandoned us? Well, the first thing we should do is pray. And if that doesn't work, which it doesn't always, because we don't have the...
don't have the strength to, to continue praying and, hope and, and trusting in that prayer. So the next thing you should do is read. This is very practical. Read something from, from the Gospels, read from the Fathers. I would say read St. Isaac or whatever saint you like and you can relate to. Then that's what you do in those periods of dryness. And the third thing, which I thought was very good, was go to sleep. Now he's talking about monks, and he's saying, wrap yourself in your cloak and go to sleep. That's a good cure. But how many have not? How many people have done that? You know, get depressed and everything. Yes, have a good sleep. I certainly have. Um, and this is very practical. Nobody likes being tempted. Everybody wants to be happy. Everybody wants everything to be easy. And this is this is a fantasy. But it's a fantasy and it leads to perdition. It does not lead to the kingdom of heaven. <laughs>